Good morning, everybody. The clock at the back says it's, I think, at 10.02, so that means, that's my cue. That means I need to get started here. Welcome to New Brunswick Church of Christ. We have a few visitors here with us today. I'm so glad to see Mark and Angie uh, visiting with us, uh, Glenda's family. And, and then we also have Jim Brooks Sr. Uh, here from Claremont as well. So uh, that's a real treat to have them here with us this morning. And obviously coming to hear their son, uh, Jim Brooks. I don't know, is it Jim Brooks Jr.? No. Uh, Jim Brooks the Younger uh, uh, speak this morning. So it's good to see everybody. I hope everybody survived all the uh, snow and ice and the weather this this week. So a lot going on in your bulletin. I want to thank everybody who stayed after last week to do um, the crafts and making the cards. Um, <clears throat> announce uh, one of the things uh, that's coming up in the bulletin is that two weeks from today, Candy Fetzer is going to do a similar craft, and she's going to make some jewelry. And I'm, I'm told that's not just for women, uh, that that's for men as well, if you want to stay and help make jewelry after uh, service, you can do that on the 27th. So uh, in a moment, we're going to do birthday Sundays. So if you are a February birthday, uh, get ready to come forward, and we're going we're gonna to serenade you in song. <clears throat> uh, all right, so more things. Uh, the big thing coming up excuse me, next weekend is the the fellowship meal uh, that's going to be going on immediately after service. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm not sure I know the name of it. Is it love one another? Is that what I saw on the back? Okay, Alicia shaking her head. Yes, uh, we're going to go with that name. Um, it's going to be just fun. They're going to play some games. Uh, but it's really important that uh, if you want to attend, you sign up uh, right there on that little table by the back that you sign up as you come in or as you ex exit today uh, because <clears throat> the meal is provided. So they need to know how much food to have on hand. And so if you, <clears throat> excuse me, if, if you notice that sign-up sheet back there, you see like just two or three names, it's because the sign-up sheet that was there is full. And so don't panic when you saw see the list like I did this morning. You're like, one person's coming? No, 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 no. We, we have a good crowd already signed up to come. And so, but do sign up. They need to know that for food purposes. <coughs> um, the uh, church cookbooks is also in the bulletin. And uh, the one of the cool things that they're going to try to do is have everybody submit family recipes uh, and then make a cookbook and give that away on Easter. So if you have a a recipe you'd like to share with a bigger group, perhaps it's a meal you've brought here to Pitchens for many, many years, uh, just submit those to any of the members of the fellowship team, whether it be the Clarks, the Slaters, the Jones, Brenda Spall, Sharon, <clears throat> uh, just go ahead and give those recipes to them. They're going to compile them. They're actually going to have them printed and bound in a book, and then we have a New Brunswick cookbook. So sounds like a lot of fun. All right. Uh, do be continuing prayer for the uh, search team. Uh, just uh, just trying to go through and evaluate candidates and uh, just a lot to be in prayer for. Uh, just uh, that God would lead us um, in the direction that he's already uh, ordained for us. Uh, the, there's the potential to get a church directory app if you want to uh, be able to con know how to contact other members of the church. See Alicia, she can give you access to an app where you can, uh, you know, know how to call or email members of the church. Obviously, this is for church pe church members only. Uh, what else? <clears throat> Alicia wanted me to announce that for a youth group tonight. Um, starts at 5 p.m. And they are going to probably go outdoors and do some things outside tonight. So uh, if you have youth and your youth are coming tonight, make sure they're dressed appropriately to be outdoors. All right, I think I've covered all of my announcements. You know what, let's go ahead and do February's birthday. So if your uh, birthday is this month, anytime this month, uh, please come forward.
Here comes Sharon. All right. Oh, here, come here, Eli. Come over here. Go stand with, with the next chair. Stand next to the chair. Did you have something in your pocket? Yeah, you do have a pen in your pocket. Okay, Terry's representing that. Okay, let's, let's sing. Yeah, Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Eli. He's giving you a lot of hugs back there. He is. And kisses. Woo! The good kind of kisses, the chocolate kind of kisses. Give me those two guys. <laughs> uh, right. And so, obviously, any of the money that we collect from the birthdays uh, goes to benefit then uh, Hanging Rock. So, thanks for everybody for that. As far as uh, prayer concerns this <clears throat> morning, things to, to share. Um, <clears throat> I was, Alicia just shared in Sunday school that Brent Kincaid's father passed. Uh, I don't know his name, uh, but uh, if you are interested in when those services will be, I think Alicia said they'll be Wednesday. Is that correct? Are they here? So at Clayton Christian Church on Wednesday, the visitation is from 11 to 1, and the funeral will be at 1. Okay, so if you know the uh, Kincaid Fainer, Brent Kincaid's father, <clears throat> just keep that in mind for, for Wednesday of this weekend. <clears throat> um, several people in our congregation just dealing with COVID. Uh, so the Terry and Dave Daniel, their son Steve, is uh, dealing with COVID. Um, Gail Coyle, who obviously... Uh, served here for many years. Um, she's dealing with COVID again, um, which is not good because uh, she had it pretty rough the first time. Uh, Alex Keene continues to deal with the effects of COVID long term. Uh, Casey Isdell just had knee replacement surgery uh, this week on Wednesday, and I talked with him on Thursday. Uh, he's doing well, uh, about as good as you can expect uh, following knee surgery. Uh, so uh, he said the first few days is just really critical to stay off, but to just continue that his knee heals quickly. Um, <clears throat> the Kings, uh, particularly Kathy King, is under the in, uh, weather with an ear infection, so they're not here this morning. Uh, just a lot to be praying for here as we open up in prayer. So uh, join with me as we go to our Father. <coughs> Our Lord and Father, I give you the praise for being able to come to your house this morning and worship you as the holy and mighty King. And uh, Lord, I pray, Lord, that our voices and our song this morning will be a pleasant aroma to you, a pleasant smell, and that you will delight in our worship to you. Lord, I ask you uh, just to be with so many of the members of our family. Uh, those who are sick and need healing, those who are grieving and just need comfort and peace. Uh, Lord, I pray for the search committee, and I pray, Lord, that uh, you'll help all of the members to be unified and that you'll give us wisdom uh, and discernment to know uh, who is the best candidate to come and lead New Brunswick. Lord, we give you the praise for uh, the snow and for the way that it just beautifies your creation. And uh, Lord, I thank you for allowing us uh, to be in your house this morning. Lord, we give you the praise and may our <clears throat> worship to you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome. We're glad that you've braved the weather and made it here today. In a little while, Jim will continue his series with Breaking Free from Fear. The subject of fear is one of the most mentioned topics in the Bible. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. 
I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. He is our refuge and our strength. Please stand and sing. the shadow of death, where perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near, and I will fear no the heart that holds on, a glorious light beyond all compare. And there will be no end to these troubles, but until that day comes, we'll live to know you're here on the earth, and I will fear no to you. 
When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Psalm 27, 1 reminds us that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? He loves us so much that he sacrificed himself for our salvation. He is with us always, and we believe in him and surrender our lives and our fears to him.
I'd start off by reading uh, Numbers uh, 21, starting at uh, verse 4. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Eden. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. When anyone who was bitten by the snake looked at it, and he lived. As we had just heard, when Moses was lead, leading the Israelites away from Egypt towards the Promised Land, the people became very impatient with their wandering and began to speak against God, blaming him for their troubles. This was when they became plagued with poisonous snakes, and many people were killed. Then they spoke differently to God. They pleaded for mercy and salvation. Moses prayed for the people. So, he instruct, so God instructed Moses to make a serpent of bronze and fasten it to a pole and lift it up before the people. 
Anyone who was bitten could look at the bronze snake and live. Jesus Christ was lifted up on the cross for the eyes of the world to see. And those who looked upon him, even though they have been poisoned by sin, will live. It's not an occasional nor it's not a casual nor occasional glance toward the cross that saves us. Instead, it is a focusing of one's attention and directing of one's whole life to the cross that brings salvation. This communion is a time to look toward the Christ on the cross, to focus our attention on him. It is a reminder to keep our lives directed toward him. Let us look to Jesus, for he will save us all. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we have all been poisoned with sin. Daily we face sin. With the help of this communion, help us to be able to look at the Christ on the cross, not just now, but daily, and in all things that we do. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. Our Lord can break the chains and free us from the bondage of fear and whatever else keeps us from him. Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great.
time we'll dismiss uh, the kids to kids church thank you ladies for your song the reminder that our god is the god who breaks those chains uh, that uh, hold us back uh, that keep us down uh, this uh, series breaking free that we've been sharing in on sunday morning uh, is uh, i guess inspired by galatians 5 1 which says it is for freedom that christ has set us free. But what we've been uh, noticing through this series is that there's still, even though we've been freed in Jesus Christ, are those things that keep us back or that do hold us down, things like guilt, things like stress, and uh, the one we're going to talk about today, fear. Want to uh, study today in Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, if you'd like to open your Bible there or scroll on your uh, device uh, to that passage, and at verse 35 is where we're going to start, verses 35 to 41. There we read, That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. The wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want in this moment to still our hearts and minds and turn our faces toward you. We want, Father, with your help to take in what you have for us from your word of truth today, that you would show us anything in our lives that uh, we need to address, changes we need to make, that, Father, you would do your great work of growing our faith, of making it deeper and stronger, that you would multiply our trust in you so that we would not be overcome by fear. Father God, I pray that you would be with me as I speak and help me to speak clearly and in a manner that is worthy of the message of Jesus Christ. And Father, we ask these things in his name. Amen. There was a small boy who was terribly afraid of thunderstorms. And uh, on one particular night when it was storming, he was very hesitant to go up the stairs to his bedroom and his mother tried to assure him there's nothing to be afraid of God will take care of you the little boy resisted and he said I I know that but he can take care of us 
better if we're all together. Then he doesn't have to keep going up to my room. Mother wasn't giving up that easy, and she said, but God is in your room, and he will take care of you there. Now, go to bed. It's okay. The boy reluctantly trudged up those stairs to his bedroom, and right then, bam, there was this terrible clap of thunder, and he shot to the top of the stairs once again, and he said, Mom, you come up here and stay with God. I'm coming down. Now, we can sympathize with uh, that little fellow. We know there are moments in life like that where fear gets the better of us. And though we might not be as vocal about our fears as that youngster was, most of us, let's be honest, have our fears. It might be one of those well-known fears like fear of heights or fear of closed-in Places, or maybe you have the, the fear of spiders, arachnophobia, or it might be something that's a lot more serious. It might be something that has a lot more of an impact on your daily life. Maybe there's a, a fear of losing your job and the economic pressure that will come as a result. Maybe you have a fear of rejection that others won't accept you. Maybe it's a fear of someone discovering who you really are and then not liking you as a result. Or maybe it's a, a fear of losing control of your life or a fear of being a burden to someone. Maybe it's even a fear of death. The reality when it comes to fear, the sad truth about fear is that it can keep us from enjoying the blessings our Father in Heaven ten, intends for us to enjoy. And it can keep us from obeying His will for our lives. And so we need, as we look at a fearful moment in the lives of the disciples today, to consider with God's help confronting our fears. The events of Mark chapter 4 take place during the very busy Galilean ministry of Jesus, the height of his popularity, the, the portion of his ministry where the crowds were so flocking to see them. And it seems the events here in Mark 4 come toward the end of an extremely demanding day of ministry. And it appears Jesus is exhausted from the day. He and his disciples get in a boat and they're going to cross over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And while they are out there on the sea, a, a storm comes, a serious storm comes. And as it comes, Jesus sleeps and the disciples panic. Jesus sleeps and the disciples panic. And the, the contrast there is significant and telling We've been where the disciples are in these moments, the, the time of fear. And along with them, we need to discover that growing in our trust of Jesus can free us from our fears. That's our big idea for today from God's word, that growing in our trust of Jesus can free us from our fears. I want us to, to make two considerations from this passage in uh, Mark chapter 4, and the first consideration is that we consider some catalysts of fear. Uh, a catalyst is an event that quickly causes change or action of some kind, and in this text, the catalyst is a great storm. And the result, of course, is the fear, the fear of the disciples. Verse 37 says, a furious squall came up and waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Now I wanted to, to start off looking at some of the causes of the disciples' fear here in Mark chapter 4 because they are the very same causes that sometimes we face that tempt us to, to fear. And I think it can be helpful 
to think about, well, what are the causes that contribute to my being afraid? And, and the first one I see in this text is an unexpected threat. There is this unexpected threat, this unexpected storm that comes their way. When we don't have time to anticipate it, when we have no opportunity to kind of weigh our options, how can I deal with this? What should I do next? It, it seems to me when a problem is sudden or a, a problem is unexpected, it's in times like that that we are most tempted to fear. A furious squall came up, it says. This was very sudden. In Matthew's account, Matthew 8, 24, of this same event, he writes, without warning, a furious storm came up. And that wording intensifies the description of this situation, that this was very quick and very surprising. Bam, all of the sudden it was there. Troubles come that way sometimes, don't they? Very unexpectedly, we didn't see it coming. But I think to us, the reassuring thing is there is no trouble we will ever face which is going to cause our Father in heaven to say, wow, I didn't see that one coming. It's never going to cause God to say, oh, I really didn't expect that. No, the one who watches over us and walks with us is our all-knowing God. In Daniel chapter 2 at verse 22, it says, He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells in Him. And in Isaiah 46, He says, I am God and there is none like Me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. Our God is an all-knowing God and He is never caught off guard by those things that trouble us. But this was unexpected, and that tempted the disciples to fear. It was also an uncontrollable challenge that they faced out there on the Sea of Galilee. And when our problems seem uncontrollable or insurmountable, we are tempted to fear. This was not, I think, an ordinary, typical storm that they faced on this particular evening. Mark says it was a furious storm, and he uses the ancient word megos to uh, describe it. It's a, it's a term we've looked at before. Our words like megaphone and megaton come from this ancient word, and it meant something was great or huge or terrible. And so this was a great, huge, terrible storm that came on them there on the sea. The word uh, that Matthew uses to describe this storm in Matthew 8 is the word seismos, which is interesting because it's a word we typically associate with earthquakes, seismic activity. And what Matthew was telling us is this storm literally shook the sea, it shook the disciples, it shook their entire world in this moment. I think it's worth thinking about, remembering that several of these men were fishermen, professional fishermen. And, and so these were men that knew a lot about boats, and they knew a lot about the sea, and they, I feel, had to know something about storms on the sea. These were things that had been a part of their lives before, but now they're reduced to fearing for their lives. And I believe the, the reason for that is they realized they come, had come to the end of their own efforts. They, they realized that they were running out of their own resources. They had tried everything they knew to do to deal with this situation of the waves coming over the, the side of their boat and they're reduced to calling out to Jesus, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. But this storm wasn't too much for their master. But there are those critical moments in situations that make us fear 
where we're at the point of, I just don't know what we're going to do. You've been there, haven't you? I, I just don't know what we're going to do. I don't know how we're going to pay the bill. I don't know how we're going to get along now that dad is gone. I don't know what we're going to do. I can't find a job. We know what it is to reach that point where our efforts have failed and we're just really at a loss for what we're going to do next. But their predicament was not too much for their master. Our predicaments are not too much for our God. In Jeremiah 32, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? And if you study the text there, the anticipated answer is, of course, no, nothing is too hard for our God. Jesus taught in Mark 10, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. You will never, ever come up against a problem in your life which is going to cause God to say, boy, I don't think I can handle that one. No, that day will not come. He is the God for our uncontrollable challenges. There, there's one more cause of fear that I see in their, in their situation here in Mark 4, and that is an unknown outcome. They reached that point in fear where they just couldn't possibly see or know or understand what was going to come next. Fear of the unknown is one of the most common fears that we face. I don't know what's going to happen next. I can't really see or understand what is ahead. That was certainly the, the case for them. They couldn't see a way out. And so anxiety took a hold. The disciples in their fear were confused. They couldn't understand how Jesus could sleep when they were frightened. And, and they couldn't understand or imagine what could he possibly do when we've tried everything and nothing has worked thus far they didn't know yet and this is a key thing to notice they didn't know yet how completely they could trust him and isn't that also true of us when we fear the unknown in proverbs 3, 5, and 6, a couple of very well-known verses. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him and He will make your path straight. And then it's interesting to me, just a, a, a verse later in verse 8, it says, This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. It's healthy to trust the Lord. Now, uh, the proverb writer says there, lean not on your own understanding. I think we could also paraphrase that here for the issue of fear. Lean not on your lack of understanding. Don't, don't give in to, don't trust in your inability to know and see and, and understand. That's, that's what the disciples were doing. They were placing more confidence we might say, in the emotion of fear in this moment than they were in the person of Jesus. Friends, our Lord loves us and does not want us to live in fear. In John chapter 14, as he's preparing the disciples for his departure, he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world does. And he says, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. That's the desire of the Lord Jesus for you, that you would not be afraid because of the work he has done for you in his life and in his death. And so I think the second consideration that we must make in the text today is that we consider some qualities of Jesus 
qualities that are perfect for our storms, qualities that are greater than our storms, qualities that can deliver us from fear. If you listen to contemporary Christian radio a couple, three years back, there was a a song that repeatedly says, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. And I think that's the kind of invitation that Jesus is giving to the disciples and to us here in, in their fear. John MacArthur, in commenting on this particular biblical story of the calming of the storm, writes that faith needs constant strengthening. And I think that's what Jesus is going to do here for the disciples as he calms the the storm. He's going to invite them to trust him further and to come out of their fear. And I see three actions that we should take here as we consider who he is. And the the first is that we need to reflect on his power. They hadn't fully discovered yet that they had a Lord great enough for the storm, a Lord sufficient for their need, even in the most troubling of times. Verse 39 says of Jesus, he got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. Friends, our storms are never more than God can handle. And we see that vividly here in this text. They're never more than God can handle. And the gospel writers, one of the things they're establishing for us in recording this story is that Jesus is the unique son of God with power over nature. Now the disciples had seen some miracles of Jesus. They had already seen him turn water to wine. They had already seen him heal multiple diseases, including the dreaded leprosy. But they had never yet seen this level of power in their master, but even the wind and waves in all their might have to yield to a simple word from his lips. In Psalm 89, it says, Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty, and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea when its waves mount up. You still them. And in the person of Jesus, we see that very power of God. Scripture is very clear, and in his uniqueness as God's one and only son, Jesus reigns over all of nature, over all creation. Hebrews 1 says at verse 3, the son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. By his powerful word, word, Jesus holds it all together. In Colossians 1, when it's talking about the greatness of Jesus, it says, He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. We see him holding things together for his disciples, even in the midst of a terrible storm. Jesus taught about God's providential care in Matthew chapter 10 when he talks about God providing even for the small sparrows of of the field and how not one of them falls to the ground without God's awareness, God's knowledge. He is tender and compassionate even for the smallest of his creatures. What we might forget is what Jesus said right after teaching that. He said, so don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. The issue for us, like the disciples, is that in times of trouble, often we forget his greatness and focus only on our problems. But 
Jesus is the answer for our fears. Who he is is exactly the remedy we need for our fears. And so if we're living in fear, we are failing to remember who he is. This same Christ cares for you in your troubles, in your storms. The one who with a word can stop the worst of storms is the one who watches over you day and night. And so we need to reflect on how great and powerful he is. But we also need to rely on his presence. We need to rely on his presence. You know, the one thing that makes the difference for their storm on the Sea of Galilee is that Jesus was in the storm with them. That made all the difference. Verse 38 tells us very simply, Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. But the critical issue is he was there. He was there. They were not alone. When God tells us not to fear in Scripture, which, by the way, he does over 300 times, he often links that to his promised presence with us. Isaiah 41.10, Nancy referred to earlier. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, for I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Let those promises wash over you that you do not need to be afraid because he is with you. Psalm 46, 1 and 2, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall in to the heart of the sea. A very present help in times of trouble. In Psalm 23, probably the best known and most loved of all the Psalms. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me presence of Jesus is the remedy for our fears because where he is trouble is changed to opportunity when you are tempted to be afraid and you will be and I will be we need to ask for reassurances from God we need to look for reassurances from God, his word is filled with the reminders that we will absolutely not be alone, whatever comes. And then the third action that I want to recommend here as we learn from the disciples' fear is to ruminate on his question. I know that's not a word we use frequently, that word ruminate, but, you know, I was really having some ideas with the letter R when I was writing this sermon. So, so I, I, I chose the word ruminate on his question. And ruminate means to chew on. It's a word that's used to describe, you know, how the cow with all of its extra stomachs can bring up its food and chew it again. But we need to, to meditate on, go over and over and over the, the question that Jesus asked here in the text. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Now, I don't think what Jesus said there to the disciples was intended to shame them. I think that Jesus asking the questions he does there in the text was intended to make them examine themselves, examine the situation. And I think what he wants us to do when we're tempted to fear is to evaluate what's happening and what we're feeling at that time. 
Unfortunately, their fear made them question their Lord in this situation. They ask him specifically, Lord, don't you care if we drown? They're actually wondering about his compassion and wondering about his commitment to them. And we do that sometimes when we hurt, don't we? They needed to be reminded that he was aware and that he did care. And that's true for our situations as well. When I was preparing the message for today, I remembered an article I read some years ago uh, about doubts and dealing with our doubts in uh, the walk of faith. And I'm sorry I can't remember more about the article than this little bit, but one of the suggestions the author made was that we try doubting our doubts. That was one of his recommendations for dealing with the doubts we go through, that we would consider doubting our doubts. And, and I want to take that and paraphrase it. We need to doubt our fears. And what I mean by that is we need to bring our fears into question. We need to stop ourselves and do some examination like they were being invited to do there in the boat. To look at questions like, why am I afraid? And is, is this fear really valid, this thing I'm afraid of? And, and is this fear that, that I'm fearing right now, is it really something that God and I together can't handle? Because I think typically the, the answer would be no. This isn't something that's going to overwhelm God or overwhelm me if I trust in him. You see, when we're tempted to fear, fear, like so many other situations, we have a choice. We have a choice of whether we're going to succumb to the fear, give in to it, and let it overwhelm us, or we're going to use this as an opportunity to learn more about our God and his faithfulness and to grow in our faith. When Jesus says, do you still have no faith? I think he's inviting them to examine further who he is and what he can do. The other day I ran into a, a quote by Craig Groeschel, and once in a while you, you hit a, a quote that just kind of smacks you right between the eyes, and I felt like this was really good as some food for thought on uh, this particular issue, and I would encourage you to carry this with you and, and just think it through. He said, what you fear the most reveals where you trust God the least. And I was like, oh, wow, that, that kind of steps on my toes a bit. That's a, that's a bit of an ouch. What you fear the most reveals where you trust God the least. Now, I think that challenge presents the opportunity for us to really do some self-examination and some fear examination and to address the, the weakness that evidently can exist in our faith. Trusting believes that trusting involves believing that God has a plan and believing that God has the ability to carry out his plan. I haven't mentioned this yet, but you know, it was the plan of Jesus that they would cross the sea on this evening when this storm came. He had a plan. And if it was his plan to sail across the sea, doesn't it stand to reason that he was going to get them through this and that he was sufficient for their journey? They just needed to learn to trust him more, and so do we. And so if you have fears, I encourage you to admit there is a problem in that area and that you need God's help with whatever that weakness is in your faith. Admit there's a problem. Talk to your father about it. Confess your trust in God's plan and in his care. Say it out loud. Even if you're not there yet, say it out loud that you want to trust his plan and his care. I encourage you to commit a time with him each day because it's in those times of communing with him, fellowshipping with him, focusing on him that you're going to discover 
a deeper faith that equips you to trust when you're tempted to fear and meditate on his promises to you. That promise that he is an ever-present help in times of trouble, that you do not need to fear for he is with you. Let those promises saturate who you are and how you look at life. In a very, another very well-known passage of Scripture in Isaiah chapter 26, it says, You keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Have you trusted God with your future? Have you trusted God with whatever it is that you're tempted to fear? Have you trusted God with your eternal destiny? If you've not yet come forward in a church service to declare your desire to place your faith in him and to have Jesus as your Savior and Lord, we're going to sing a decision song for just a moment right after we pray. We invite you to come and to place your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord as we stand and sing. For those of us who have already made that decision, if there's an area of fear that you're recognizing this morning that, well, you're losing the battle there in that, in that temptation to, to be overwhelmed by what makes you afraid, I hope you'll ask him to increase your faith as we make our decisions responding to his word today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray like the Father in the New Testament did. Lord, we believe, but, but God, address our unbelief. Strengthen our faith. Help it to increase, to grow, and to deepen because you want us to enjoy freedom from fear in the hope that you have given us in Jesus. So, Father, we just keep on asking that you would increase our faith, that you would grow it, that you would deepen it, that you would give us the will and the desire to do whatever we need to do to keep growing closer to you. Father, if there is someone here today who has not yet accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord, our prayer is that this would be the moment that individual decides to do so today. We pray that you would give that one courage to come knowing that you love he or she and will rejoice that they want to come and walk with you. Be with us now as we respond to your word, God. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our song of decision.
Jim. Uh, I have I have a lot of fears. My biggest fear is speaking in public. I get so scared and nervous when I get up here. And then I found out this week in uh, our <clears throat> preacher search meeting that we live stream this. Uh, so right now there's millions of people across the world watching me right now in 30 different languages. So uh, a lot of times we, we make more of our fears than what they really are. And uh, worse than that, I personally don't take my fears to God. So uh, just remember, like Jim said, uh, you know, take your fears. He's with us, and uh, there's nothing to fear right now. Uh, just another reminder about youth group tonight, uh, dress warm. Uh, we will, when I say we, it'll be Lisha and Cora. We'll be outside, not me. <clears throat> so uh, dress warm for tonight for a couple short games outside. And um, if there's nothing else, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your son who died on the cross for us, and we thank you for that assurance that uh, Jim uh, reminded us of this morning that uh, we, there's nothing to fear as long as we have you with us. Just help us to remember to take you with our daily walk and uh, just be able to show our, our uh, shining light to the whole entire world. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen.